This video is brought to you by Dollar Shave Club. Get a shave starter set for only $5 and check out their great holiday gift sets. After that, the restock box will ship full-size products at the regular price. Go to dollarshaveclub.com forward slash brain food to get started. In the video today, we are answering a viewer question because Stefan G asks us, why do we still have pubic and armpit hair when we lost most of the rest of the hair in our bodies? It is a biological mystery that has perplexed humanity throughout the ages, especially in recent times when so many, particularly of the female persuasion, go to such great lengths to remove it. So what useful purpose could pubic and armpit hair possibly serve? Is it just mother nature playing a sick joke on us, or maybe she owns stock? in Gillette. Although there's no definitive answer, plenty of hypotheses abound as to why human beings have hairy armpits and pubic regions, one of which seems pretty reasonable. One hypothesis that's not quite as reasonable, though still slightly plausible, is that the hair's purpose is to reduce friction. Skin constantly rubbing against skin can cause major discomfort to our sensitive bits, and armpit hair is thought to act as a barrier against such rashes and irritation, and perhaps even reducing the chances of acquiring an STD by providing something of a buffer. Sounds logical enough, but how many people complain about armpit irritation that's not caused by shaving itself? And that STD thing, it doesn't really come into play with the pits, at least we hope, but we're not judging. As far as pubic hair acting as friction protection during sexual intercourse, as some suggest, it would take an awful lot of rather enthusiastic sex to warrant a permanent buffer. If this is necessary in your case, well, I salute you. Another suggestion as to the reason for pubic hair in particular is that it acts as a genital blanket of sorts. This seems plausible until you consider the location of male pubes, which really don't keep the important bits all that cozy. Also, females would have hairy lower torsos to keep their internal reproductive organs toasty, and, well, that's not the case. Thankfully. It does seem Mother Nature did a great job of providing women with perfectly placed pubic hair to help keep dirt from entering the vagina, but the guys have no such protection around the urethra. At least for females, genital tresses perform the same protective function that cilia do for the nose and brows and lashes do for the eyes. But as with many things in nature, the leading theory as to why we still have pubic and underarm hair is to increase the chances of getting lucky. This is perhaps backed up by the fact that, unlike hair on your head, armpit and thick pubic hair tend to show up during puberty. Around the same time, your apocrine sweat glands become active and begin secreting an oily substance containing a variety of proteins and things like that. These apocrine glands are, among a few other places, concentrated in your armpits and genitals, unlike your other main type of sweat glands, eccrine glands, which are distributed pretty well throughout your body. Pubic and armpit hair also usually begin to thin out significantly, starting around when people hit their 50s, perhaps another indicator that it's all about finding a compatible mate. More specifically, it is theorized by some that the hair exists for the purpose of getting soaked in potential mate-attracting pheromones. This initially odorless secretion turns into a musky smell after various microbes have had their way with it. A potential mate picks up this scent, and their body uses it as an indicator that you are ready to make the beast with two backs, or whatever the kids are calling it these days. Further, whether consciously detected or not, each individual gives off a slightly different scent thanks to something known as the Major Histocompatibility Complex MHC. Studies such as one having women smell the armpits of t-shirts previously worn by various men who in turn wore no deodorant or the like have shown that people with dissimilar MHC feel more attracted to each other and, in fact, often become aroused when catching a whiff of such a person. While the research is not wholly conclusive, there is some evidence that when two people with such differing MHC make a baby, they can expect a lower than average rate of miscarriage. It is also thought that greater genetic diversity results in offspring being less susceptible to disease, both suggesting an evolutionary benefit to heeding what your nose is telling your brain about a person based on apocrine secretions. Thus, the theory goes that because the hair naturally wicks these secretions away from the skin, it allows for better ventilation and a more prominent smell than you'd achieve without it. So, speaking of hair and grooming, well, today's video is rather appropriately sponsored by Dollar Shave Club. I want to tell you about them before we get into the bonus facts today. So, you might think it a bit odd that I would be advertising a shaving company because I clearly have a beard, but I still have to shave 
I just shave my head instead. Now, I used to use an electric razor, but I never really found it gave that close of a shave. Then I moved to blades, but I kept cutting myself because I was buying the cheap ones. Then I moved to super expensive blades, and those were great, but really expensive. And then I discovered Dollar Shave Club. With Dollar Shave Club, that quality shave, those quality razors, they don't come with a massive price tag. And who wants to buy crazy expensive razors at the store? It just doesn't make sense. It just hurts too much. But it's not just shaving. Dollar Shave Club also cover all of your grooming needs, whether that's shower, oral care, deodorants, it's all covered. Also, it's the holiday season, so Dollar Shave Club have gifts available. Now there are gift sets, there's also gift cards, or if you really want to be a legend to your friend or family member, why not get them a reblancho? Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's a combination of a robe, a blanket, and a poncho. All in one. Dollar Shave Club is a great place to find a great gift for your significant other, father, brother, or just a friend. It's amazing. So look at this great stuff. I mean, these are the blades they send out. So this is like a refill set. Uh, I've got one actually on here that I'm already using, and there's three refill blades in here. This is executive handle. It's really nice and weighty. And of course, the shave butter. So go to dollarshaveclub.com forward slash brain food and get started today for just $5 and check out the great holiday gift sets. Once you've started, the restock box will ship at the regular price. Uh, let's get into that bonus fact. Shaving one's pubic region is nothing new in history. From the ancient Egyptians to modern day times, the trend has come and gone and then come again. For instance, in the 15th century, it was commonplace for women, particularly, to shave their pubic hair for hygienic reasons, particularly as a defense against lice. But now imagine doing that with little more than a really sharp knife. This practice actually led to the development of the merkin, essentially a vagina wig worn for cosmetic reasons, donned to cover up bare lady bits. Such a wig also had the great advantage of being easy to remove and clean in a much harsher fashion than the hair that's attached to you. This ensured that things stayed as hygienic as possible. It's also often suggested that prostitutes used merkins to conceal obvious signs of venereal disease, but there doesn't seem to exist much in the way of any real evidence to support that claim. And certainly the wider reported rumor today that it was commonly used to cover syphilis is highly unlikely. Signs of primary syphilis in women often present on the cervix. But even if it was covering signs around the more visible vaginal area in a specific case, unless the merkin was covering large portions of the woman's body, it probably wasn't going to be hiding secondary syphilis, which can include rashes on the trunk and extremities, among other widespread visual symptoms that ultimately occur roughly two to eight weeks after primary syphilis rears its microbial head. That's not to say it's not possible merkins were used to hide signs of certain STDs. It seems tangible enough, though one would think if it was a common practice, as is often claimed, men interested in not getting diseases would have simply taken a few seconds to check under the merkin before doing the deed with a given lady. But either way, there doesn't actually seem to be much in the way of any documented evidence to support this idea, and certainly its widespread use in hiding syphilis, as is claimed in just about every other modern source we consulted on the history of merkins, seems highly suspect. And if you're wondering what merkins were made of, well, that would be a variety of soft fabrics or even hair. It's even often claimed they were made of beaver pelts, which led to the alternate use of the word beaver. In truth, however, it would seem there was no such popularity of beaver pelts for merkins, with documented examples made of things like human, horse, or goat hair. But even if beaver pelts were popular for this historically, the first known instance of beaver meaning vagina didn't appear until 1927 in Immortalia by a gentleman about town, where it states, There was a young lady named Eva, filled up the bath to receive her. She took off her clothes from her head to her toes, and a voice at the keyhole yelled beaver. Given this is a relatively modern slang term for lady bits, the popularity of merkins had severely waned by the 20th century, and there is no documented connection between these early references and the merkin. It seems unlikely that the beaver slang had anything to do with merkins. And finally, speaking of pubic hair, while the practice of shaving one's private bits has been around for ages, the 19th century British took it to a whole other level. It was common at this time to cut off some of your pubic hair and give it to a lover as a gift. Men would even affix this hair to their hats. When not displaying it in such ways, keeping a collection of it from one's various lovers was a thing. For instance, King George IV kept his collection of women's pubes from his various mistresses in a snuffbox. St. Andrews University in Scotland currently possesses this snuffbox filled with random dead women's pubic hair. Once again, humans are weird. QED. 
So I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also, why not subscribe to another channel I do called Highlight History? Link to below. And as always, thank you for watching.